Okay, how do I sound? Thank you. All right, so I'm Jamie. I work on the human interface team at Heroku, and I've been an Ember aficionado for how long? Since 2012 or so. Um, I care about the things I'm going to talk about in this talk because I think Ember has had a fundamental and outsized impact on raising the bar for what web applications can be. And I think the way the Ember community has achieved that is by baking our values and the standards to which we hold ourselves into our tools and repeating over the years. So this is kind of to take that thought and think about where else it could be applied. Um, to give you an idea of what kind of talk this is, it's not a techniques talk. You won't learn stuff you can practically use straight away. It's not a deep dive into how things work today. And it's not really any kind of grand vision of the future. It's more of a what if, pulling at some threads and seeing where they lead. And the focus is UI testing. Um, it's perfect that I'm going on after all the things that Toby just wonderfully introduced. I think Ember's testing toolkit is incredible and undersung. I think there are few SDKs or frameworks that provide as much out of the box in terms of UI testing as Ember does. That said, when you have great tools, it's even more important to ask questions of them, not to take them for granted, to keep on pushing them and see where they might go. So that's what I want to do. Ask questions of UI testing, what else we could get it to say about our applications. And I've got two high-level sources of inspiration to drive these questions. The first is Apple's UI testing toolkit, which actually only arrived in 2015. But when it did, it had a really interesting characteristic, and I want to play you a clip from the WWDC announcement from that year. So now I want to talk a little bit about accessibility and UI testing. So I mentioned earlier that accessibility data is what makes UI testing possible. So given that, it's not hard to see how the quality, quality of the accessibility data really impacts your testing. In fact, the better the accessibility data for your application, the easier it is to write tests and the more reliable those tests are over time. So you get a double benefit when you improve the accessibility in your application. You've not only made it easier for your own testing, but you've improved the experience for all of our disabled users. So I'd really encourage you to keep that in mind when you're working with UI testing and accessibility. When I first saw this talk on the internet, um, this idea blew me away. It's, it's so elegant. A reciprocal forcing function that gives you a double benefit of making your apps more accessible. And the thing is, I think Apple probably arrived at it out of necessity. If you've ever installed an app on your Mac and have it ask you to enable access for assistive devices, what it's really asking for is give me scripting access. And it just so happens that the accessibility tree is the most consistent form of scripting access you can find on that platform. Now, on the web, we have the DOM. We've always had access to everything we want to touch and we can simulate any event we want to. But it got me to thinking, what if we did have that same constraint? What if we could somehow impose access via accessibility upon our own UI tests? Could we be sort of forced down the same um, virtuous path that Apple's developers are? So that's the first source of inspiration. The second is very much of the web itself. It's not Tim Berners-Lee's hair or computer. It's the rule of least power, which says, Expressing constraints, relationships, and processing instructions in less powerful languages increases the flexibility with which information can be reused. The less powerful the language, the more you can do with the data stored in that language. Which again got me to thinking, this rule has been validated over the course of the web's existence. 
and it's been validated in, in our microcosm as well, Ember's templating language has become, in some sense, simpler as questions of scope have been resolved over the years, while the underlying engine has become orders of magnitude more powerful. Um, maybe we can treat our UI tests in the same way. If we could use a less powerful language, we could reinterpret what our tests mean over time, add more meaning to them as time passes, and that meaning could come not just from our own apps, but from community solutions, from add-ons. And the good news is that we already have a really constrained language in UI tests. Essentially, for most kind of behaviors that we want to talk about, it's these four verbs. But I think we can still push it further. So that's what we're going to do in this talk. We're going to take this UI test, this acceptance test, and we are going to ask questions of it. Can we impose access via accessibility? Can we use a less powerful language? And can we get this test to say more about the application? So let's begin by looking at fill-in. So the first argument to fill-in is a selector, which I would describe as, as a kind of maximally powerful language, for this context at least. Not a Turing complete language, I don't think, but you can reach as far into the DOM as you want to. You can be arbitrarily precise about what you're, what you're grabbing. And that, thinking about the rule of least power, the more precise you are today, the less you can reinterpret what that means in the future. So can we make that first argument? Can we define it in a less powerful language? And if we want to impose access via accessibility, then the answer of what we put in that place is quite obvious. We put the semantic label for the thing we're trying to interact with. So if we wrote our test like this, what benefits would we get? And I think Rubyists in the room will probably recognize this as being basically what Capybara looks like. And in my experience, Capybara works quite well. So given that we have our test in this form, set aside for the fact that it's more readable, we could find um, Failures like this, failures that tell us a little bit more about how our app is misbehaving. So this test failed because uh, it could not find a form control labeled body. So I look at my template, hastily implemented template, and I find indeed I missed the label off of the body text area. And it might seem contrived, but I can totally imagine myself on a lazier day looking at the design or looking at the spec and going, oh, you know, this, this UI pattern, everyone recognizes it. Everyone knows what that big text area in the middle is for. I don't need to put a label on this. But of course, for a screen reader user, their screen reader is simply going to announce text field but not tell them what it's for, what value is meant to be contained there. Which is a broken UI. It's a broken and confused experience, which you need not deliver because it's so easy to fix. So with that one change, our test would be green again. So this isn't how fill-in works today. So how might we implement a fill-in that does work like this? So rather than importing fill-in from Ember test helpers, let's say that we import some alternate version of fill-in that wraps Ember's version. It might look like this. Um, rather than a selector as that first argument, it takes a label. And then it goes in search of a form control that is labeled with that text for some definition of labeled by, some definition that um, matches the accessibility mechanics of the browser. And then it delegates to Ember test helpers fill in. Finding the form control, well, um, one way to do it would be to find a label that contains that text and then use the uh, dot .control DOM API to find the associated control for that label. If we can't find things that way, we can go and look for a control that is labeled some other way. And then uh, if we can't find anything, that is labeled by our definition of labeled, we can throw errors, we can throw more specific errors depending on the circumstances. Finding a label is simply finding all, uh, all labels in the DOM and finding the one that contains the text we're interested in. And finding a control, well, this, this is a, an incomplete idea of what it would look like to um, find a control labeled in another way, but you can imagine it might be, it's an input or a text area or a select whose title, aria label, or placeholder, again, contains the text we're interested in. So now we've got a, um, 
a more readable test, but that now also says something more. It also says that our form controls are semantically labeled, and it will warn us if we break that contract with the user. So let's turn our attention to click, and let's just do exactly the same substitution, a less powerful language as the argument. Now we might get a failure like this. Could not find a button containing submit. We go have a look at our submit button, and indeed, I really wanted an animated GIF in my submit button, so I wrote this goofy markup, and now I realize it's a terrible idea with, that leads to a broken experience, so let's replace it with text that can be understood by everyone. And now our tests are green. What might this alternative click helper look like? Well, again, it's the same kind of idea. We're going to um, reinterpret what that argument means, go in search of an element that matches our criteria, uh, throw an error if we can't find anything, and then delegate to Ember test helpers click. For finding an element, again, it's not a complete definition of um, what it means for an element to be clickable, for, like to find a clickable thing, but, you can, but the, the beauty is if the exact definition isn't included in the test, it can change over time. It can become more spec complete. So here we're looking for a button or an A with an href or something with the button role that um, matches this text we're passing in, where matching could mean um, it contains the text inside or its title is that text or its ARIA label includes that text. Again, this is just a flavor, not strictly an implementation, but to, it's to demonstrate these things could be relatively easy to write. Okay, so now we've taken steps in the direction of, of applying the rule of least power and imposing access via accessibility. Now let's ask, what more can this test say? How about getting between elements? Can we say something about that? So now I look at this test and it's almost like the kind of script you would give to a human tester. Visit this page, I can imagine myself sitting down, filling in the title with example, hitting tab, typing in this is my issue, tab type, tab type, tab, return to submit the form. What if our test could assert that we are, again, meeting that contract for what tab does, for what moving focus means? What if they could fail like this? The user would have to tab backwards to reach the button containing submit. Again, on my lazy Adopia days, I could imagine myself like looking at the design and thinking, okay, so it's like title, body, submit button, and then secondary fields over here. And with my rudimentary CSS skills, I would go, okay, so I think I'm gonna have to put the, CS, I have to put the submit button above the other stuff to get the layout that I want. But of course, this is, this is weird. You're gonna tab to submit and then tab again to get to the secondary fields and then have to sort of rewind to get back. Even worse for a screen reader user where you might get to that submit button and assume, quite rightly really, that there is nothing beyond it and never discover the secondary fields. So let's move that submit button to where it belongs and then our test agree. So what might a helper that, that, that asserts this property of your, your UI look like? So we'll take our click by label wrapping helper and add a bit more to it. Here, we'll use some kind of helper function called ta calculate tabs to the target element. And for this specific error message, we'll say that if tabs is less than zero, i.e. you're gonna have to tab backwards to get to the target, we'll throw that error. Calculate tabs to, I mean, again, this is a naive implementation, but it's not as hard as it might seem. You, we want to get hold of the active element and then get hold of all the tabbable elements in the UI, that is, all of those with tab index greater than or equal to zero. And then we'll say, where is the active element in this array of tabbables? Where's the target element in this array? If the target element isn't there at all, we can throw an error saying you, you couldn't reach this via tabs, therefore you're shipping a broken UI. Um, otherwise, we'll return the difference between these two positions. And that then, I mean, you can imagine maybe extending this to say, not only should you not have to tab backwards to get between elements, but you shouldn't have to tab more than three or four times to get between elements. And again, like, this might seem like a contrived thing, but I think we've probably all used government websites 
where the tab ordering is just crazy. And, you know, again, I know personally on my lazy Adopia days, I, I make stupid mistakes like this. It would be nice if the tools kept me on the straight and narrow. So what more can we say? And actually, Melanie queued me up beautifully for this one. When is a click not a click? Right here, when I think all of us expect to hit return to submit the form rather than clicking on it with the mouse. So what kind of assertion failures might we have here? Because to some extent, template linting can keep us away from these kind of problems, but let's just think. So imagine if the test failed in this way. What this is saying is the, the overall behavior failed, but you'll notice in the title of the test we've got with keyboard in parens at the end. So what I'm imagining here is kind of like a, a variant of the test that uses keyboard clicking rather than mouse clicking, because you, you want to support both ultimately. Um, it fails because indeed we've used an on click on our button, which is only going to work with the mouse. Who even knows what it's gonna do with the keyboard? It could be something really wacky. We wanna use this instead, which gives us all the functionality we'd come to expect from a form in HTML. That will make our test green, but we're still left with this question of if, oh, sorry, <laughs> slides in the wrong order. So firstly, what might keyboard click look like as a, as a sibling to the click helper? So it's mostly the same, our same extra assertions in there, except down here, rather than using, rather than delegating to the click helper internally, we can use some of Ember test helper's other functions, first focus the element we're interested in, and then trigger in sequence the various key events. I think I'm right in saying that the on submit behavior doesn't get triggered when you use synthetic events like this. Maybe there is a way to do it, I'm not sure. But you could imagine adding some heuristic which does trigger it in the right circumstances. So the substitution we want to perform is swapping out click for keyboard click and adding with keyboard to the title. Again, this is like one way you could imagine doing this. And this might strike you as like, well, that's that seems like a lot of bookkeeping and overhead to have to write a duplicate test to ensure this. Um, not to mention keeping the tests in sync. But I had a little play with writing a, even with my rudimentary skills, writing a Babel plugin to generate that sibling test automatically, and it's doable. It's doable in about 100 lines of Babel plugin. So, we now have a test that says something about the UI we're interacting with being semantically labeled. It says something about how we can move focus between elements, and it says something about it being, you know, supporting keyboard interaction correctly. How about saying something about how it treats the network? It might be interesting to ask, what's the network up to at this point? Imagine if we could have a failure like this. The application made three requests after clicking submit. Uh, it posted to issues, that seems right, and then it got the labels for the issue it just created, but then it fetched the issue again, this time with the labels included. That seems wrong in all sorts of different ways. Arguably, it shouldn't have needed to make any more than one request, but like this, this, when I put this example together, I was surprised by how many things it was pointing out to me. And again, like you might say that, okay, you could encode the request expectations up at the acceptance test level, but the more you say explicitly in your test, the less you can say as time passes. So what went wrong in this case? Um, this is the uh, task for submitting this form. We um, do a bit of work to look up the related labels. We create the record in the store. We, we wait on the save, and then we transition to the, the route for the new issue. And here, we're passing the ID, which means that it's gonna go via the model hook and it's gonna make another lookup for an issue that we already have loaded. So let's just pass the issue instead, uh, bypass the model hook, as contentious as you may find that. But we're still, we're still making this request for labels, which doesn't seem quite right because we selected the labels. We, we, like, all the data in theory has come from the user in this case. Why are we making this extra request? Well, it turns out Emma Data is doing exactly the right thing. In the payload that came back from the post, we're told that, there's, that 
there's a relationship for labels, and it can be looked up by accessing this URL. So Ember Data is saying, I can't guarantee that I've got the full picture here. I best make another request when labels is accessed to complete the object graph. So this is kind of interesting. This tells us something actually holistically about the system. It tells us that when we create an issue with our server, we're kind of leaving some things unsaid. So it's debatable exactly where you, want, you might want to fix this, but in this case, I could just in my Mirage serializer sort of mandate in the contract for creating an issue that the labels that go with that issue come back included. And that would have our test green with like one atomic request going on. Now, obviously, it's not super practical to say that every key interaction should only trigger one request, but I think that this little example demonstrates that your test can start to tell you some quite interesting things if you're exposing this data. Um, how might it be implemented? Well, uh, we've got our, again, our wrapping click helper here. Let's just elide the bits we're not interested in. Um, we will switch this over to be an async function and await the click rather than returning it. And then let's imagine that we had a track requests helper function sitting about somewhere. And that what it does is to wrap up some operations and capture any requests that went over the wire when those operations were performed. And then we can make assertions about them. We can say, okay, so if uh, the number of requests that happened during this click was greater than one, we can construct some kind of error message that tells us what's going on. Track requests, it turns out, by integrating with Mirage is pretty easy to write. We get hold of Pretender, the thing that's driving Mirage, and we keep track of how many requests had been handled prior to executing the block, and then we await execution of the block, and then we get everything that followed, and then we return it. And then to uh, construct that sort of pretty output that you saw, it's just, you know, whatever you want to use from the request object. And we get something like this. And I think, uh, again, like, I was surprised by how useful this would be, and it got me to thinking kind of how many more things could you, you say if you started down this track? So to conclude, um, we took this test, and we asked of it, whoop, <laughs> we asked of it, can we impose access via accessibility? Can we use a less powerful language? And can we get this test to say more? And guarantee that we can continue to say more by abiding by those first two principles. And we ended up with this test, which is not only more readable, but also tells us that our application, or at least the behavior that we're describing in this test, is semantically labeled, tabbable, supports keyboard interaction, and uses the network sparingly. I can imagine thinking about test helpers in this way and kind of looking at what we had to do in those wrapping helpers. What starts to emerge are hooks in the helpers, actions that you can take before you trigger the behavior, actions that you take after, maybe that you wrap around the behavior in question. And again, there's precedent for this. There's precedent for it in Capybara and other, other testing frameworks. So that's the big idea, but don't treat it as a big idea, just treat it as a what if. Um, you may be thinking to yourself, why didn't Jamie mention all of the great add-ons that are out there that help to do this kind of thing, to make tests say more. So I'm gonna mention them now. Uh, Ember A11Y testing, Ember CLI page object, Ember test selectors, all wonderful tools to help make tests more readable, make tests say more, make them more maintainable. And it wouldn't be an EmberConf talk without a slide thanking this person, but I want you to treat this slide as representing Robert Jackson plus the pile of wonderful people who made his RFCs a reality. And I would like to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to me. <laughs>